please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we're going to be talking about the Delphi case. The case that literally never sleeps and just when you think there's just one more piece of news, you know, like a new trial date. No, no, no. Now it's raining Delphi documents. So we've got a lot to go through and we have a very special guest joining us today as well. Welcome to all my moderators. Thank you so much for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons members and all the new subscribers existing subscribers everybody uh thank you for being here please like and share with hashtag delphi hashtag uh justice for libby and abby or you could use abby and libby that would be great if you could do that uh, cassie's corner said this case is so wild hi everyone hello g i love the hair i oh, thank you so much so before we get started look guys <laughs> it's midnight here so i've got my coffee okay we're ready and we have a lot to talk about so let me bring our special guest in. Hello to James from Who's Your Cold Cases. Hi, Gisela. How are you? Thanks so much Hi. for having me on. Yeah, I'm great. And thank you so much for being here. It's been a long time coming. Thank you for Hi. finally being a guest on the show. I'm so glad to talk to you about this case, which is wild. <laughs> yes. Hi, Mods. Hi, Grizzlies. Good to see all of you as well. Friends. Lots of friends in here tonight. <laughs> yes. Um, and if you guys don't know about Who's Your Cold Cases yet, one, check out my playlist because we've shown some of your footage before, which was incredible. You went out there just to show the area so that people can understand the case better as well. And two, mods, if you could share the link, I did forget to activate, uh, activate Nightbot now for the, that link. So if you could share the link to Who's Your Cold Cases, I would really appreciate that. Okay. So could you please introduce yourself to everybody who might not know you and your channel when it started and, you know, what you're all about? My name is James Wright. Uh, I live in Lafayette, Indiana, just uh, very close to Delphi. I have family in Delphi and um, actually my grandparents are buried in the cemetery there uh, by the bridge, which I didn't know existed. Uh, drive underneath of it a lot, the, the Freedom Bridge anyway, the blue one. But uh, I remember being at work when it was all across the news that two girls had gone missing in Delphi. And um, one of my coworkers is also a volunteer firefighter. And he was one of the first people to kind of clue me in on how weird and horrible the case was. He wouldn't tell me specifics, but um, I could tell it really freaked him out. And I didn't really find YouTube until about 2019. And my friend Incognito Society uh, had these amazing shows. Reminds me of your show a lot, actually, where the chat was fun and, uh, you know, just a fun, healthy place to talk about the case. And um, she's like, get up here on panel with me. And I was like, OK. And then eventually she's like, you need to start your own show. And uh, I didn't know the horrors that would bring at the time. But <laughs> uh, so I, I'm. A small cha small channel and I really just try to add where my unique perspective might fit in and uh, there's room for everyone in the creator space I think uh, we all have our unique perspectives there's some terrible people out there that aren't good but whatever you know just ignore it <laughs> um, <Right? laughs> and so I I was just I had all kinds of questions and then you know, I started my channel and I found some really great friends and have uh, found more really great friends. And, you know, I have some real life best friends from this case, uh, you know, and we spend Christmas together and, and Halloween and um, and, you know, send each other gifts and things like that. And it's it's a uh, it's been a wild ride, to say the least. Especially in the Delphi true crime community. That's probably the wildest ever, <laughs> like on YouTube. Like what a community and very divided. Although I feel like the way that things are going now, there's majority are starting to be a little more open-minded, right? 
I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, see it seems so. <laughs> Maybe I'm being too positive. But yeah, there's like a lot to discuss. Right? <laughs> right? We can just be hopeful <laughs> that we can all remain open minded. Um, yes, Richard Allen is innocent or proven guilty. And at this point, the case that they are presenting so far, wow, it's lacking. Even, don't you think it's so crazy that there's a two week trial? I mean, most trials that I cover is a minimum of three weeks. Two weeks? I, I'm, it, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, one of my personal heroes, Ann Burgess, one of the original Mine Hunters, like her biggest takeaway was they needed to bring in experts from the get go. And there's this theme in this case of not bringing in experts. And I can't imagine two weeks being enough for something so complex. Right? Seven years, a two week trial. Wow. Does the state really have anything? It's not looking good. Uh, and the more we learn, the kind of the worse it looks. Uh, the organization maybe is a problem. This is first. This is the first kind of situation of such a strange case for Carroll County in general. So. Right. I know that on your show, you generally quote that the solving homicides in Indiana is not a very high rate, right? It's less than 50%, right? Yeah. I, and even when you look back over the 60 plus years they've been recording this, um, it doesn't get much better in solve rate. And nationally, over the past 60 years, we rank the third lowest here in Indiana for solve rates. So off the get-go, it's not, you know, whether it's funding or training, uh, it's probably a combination of that, honestly. Right. Oh, my gosh. That is so scary. So, yes, um, we have a lot of news to discuss, you guys. I had a lot of questions, but I think we're going to dive in there because everything I was going to ask <laughs> is about, you know, for example, let me ask this one before we get started with the new documents. If you guys didn't know, the trial is now set for May 13th, and it's for two weeks. So that was going to be the big update, but there's even bigger updates now and a rabbit hole to dive into. <laughs> so one of my questions was, I really enjoyed your conversation that you had with Delphi Off the Dark, mm. where you were talking about in depth the, the Frank's memorandum. And firstly saying, of course, that many people just dismiss it and just like, oh, it's nonsense. And the defense made it up. And yet they didn't even read the whole document. Right. Well, so, that's that's a theme in this case as well. People lead their knowledge with what somebody else told them to think too often. The black and white thinking uh, it's either this or that. And then there's a lot of emotion goes into um just because you don't agree with exactly how I feel, you must be wrong and you're the enemy type thing. And it's rough. It creates a toxic environment for this. Um, but, you know, a lot of the bigger cases are like that. The yeah, Franks... It, the, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm just agreeing with you. It really, it really is like that. And that Franks memorandum, I mean, it was very interesting in my opinion. And, you know, when people say... Richard Allen, you know, I'm sure you hear it as well, when it's like, he was wearing the blue jacket and he said he was there. Well, from the new documents we're going to look at today, apparently other people were there with cell phones. We'll look at that now. But he said he was there and he confessed. I like how you say that, well, how do we know what he even said? We haven't heard it, firstly. But then mm. you bring out the Frank's memorandum, Elvis Fields, mm. and him confessing. No one looks at that. And we know what he said. Exactly. And it's Multiple horrifying. Times. To multiple people. Uh, the Frank's memorandum, you know, this whole Odin angle, I think people can't get past that because we've never really heard of such a thing. And even I living in Indiana and seeing people with the Thor's hammer and all this stuff, you're just like, oh, that's cool or whatever. But then when you really start digging into Odinism and its origins in the prison systems, um, when you look at actual FBI investigations of the infiltration of Odinism into the prison system as far back as 2002. Like, that's super scary. Um, wh why? And, and there's a lot of money to be had through 
drugs and prison um and uh, being a dirty security guard in a prison or whatever um you know it's very lucrative uh c can be but then also you know there's like this uh, racism that underlines all of it um the kkk was very prolific in indiana and probably still is i uh, you know the majority of people see i even see people who have like husbands or family members that are in these motorcycle clubs that are like oh they're good people they have fundraisers yeah but they're on the fbi terrorist lists for uh murder drugs um even even as far as uh child abductions and and uh um sex trafficking and it's like that's what these biker gangs do it's it's a lot worse than you think on the surface and when you have guards uh their boss is like hey take that odin patch off and he goes and gets it an odin tattoo right on his face because it's that important to him that that's the crazy. people in prison know he's an odinist like this is super weird and maybe odinism has nothing to do with this case at all but trained professionals in the field um scholars more than one think that it is so it is worthy of thinking about of looking at and properly vetting all of it so exactly i like to look at everything you know especially because we don't have that much evidence right before a trial everything that comes out is important and interesting to look at absolutely and you know none of us have the answers neither does the defense either right because <laughs> the filings today and, and and I don't think the cops do either because they, you know, they thought it was Odinists for the first like three years from what we see from Jerry Holman leaking to the public in Facebook groups and ride alongs and things like that. This is all proven without a doubt. And so it leads into what we're talking about further today, you know, with these. <laughs> It definitely does. Let me just see if there's any other questions. Oh, one question before we dive into the documents. Like, how do you feel about this case at the moment? Do you think that there can be a fair trial for Richard Allen? And do you think there will be a conviction? Oh, wow. I want... I want this case to be solved for the families, for the girls, for all the people that this case has captured their hearts. There's a lot of people... Uh, that deep that feel very deeply and passionately about justice for those girls, for Abby and Libby. And we all want the truth. Uh, and we all want the right person to be, you know, in prison for this uh, forever and off the streets. And I don't think it's going to be as clear cut as anyone wants either way. But in our system, it is about if there's any reasonable doubt at all, then you can't convict. And from what I've seen, what the public has seen so far, there is way too much reasonable doubt, especially what was released today. Yeah, has been weighing so heavy on my mind since I read it earlier. Right. It's so much. <laughs> So much uh, more of a rabbit hole, you guys, than we ever thought we we're going to discuss today. So let me bring up some of these documents. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. As I said to you before I started the live stream, you guys, I said in the chat there, it's raining <laughs> documents in Delphi. Thank you to the Unraveling for posting the Delphi Docs link on X because I was able to quickly download all of them right before the stream. Just when I thought there was one 18-page one that was interesting to discuss. No, no, <laughs> there's many, many more. So I thought what I would do is quickly power through some of these highlights, you know, just some of the documents. Um, we can go through it all slowly at some point, Grizzly. But for now, it's just there's so much to go through. We'll be sitting here for six hours. <laughs> we went through mm -hmm. it all word for word. So the first one, everything was filed today. Motion to stay all ancillary proceedings to get this case to trial. Now, this is big guns. David Hennessy, 
uh, for obviously representing attorneys Baldwin and Rosie. And he is saying he respectfully moves the court to stay all ancillary proceedings and get this case to trial. <laughs> That's the tone I read in. Just get this case to trial. And then they give all their reasons. And at the bottom here, it says, in short, the court and attorneys need to get back to the critical issues and stop the diversionary filings, which I feel the state is doing. Do you also feel like that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's like they're not ready, even though they've had seven years. <laughs> And and they're doing everything they can to delay. But that's not an option anymore, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, they're not playing now. Not that they ever were. I don't feel like, okay, some people feel like the defense playing games and making up things, you know. I'm not quite on that page. Like, I'm, I find what are... they find interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ignorant. <laughs> I think we but... can all agree, though, we're all happy to see this go to trial. Yes, yeah, and I hope it does. I really hope nothing gets in the way, but I like how suddenly David Hennessy is coming in and saying, listen, <laughs> let's get this case to trial. And it's kind of like they're putting their foot down now. They, they're now done playing games. You know, like, okay, you know, McClelland, it just, I don't know, it comes across as very kindergarten-like, the things that he does a little bit, <laughs> you know. that. Yes. I'm so glad that finally somebody's saying, listen, this is enough now. So here as well, they say motion for specific findings of fact and conclusions thereon. Now, defense counsel again, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rosie by counsel David Hennessy respectfully request that this court issue findings of fact and conclusions thereon with respect to the contempt proceeding scheduled for March 18th of 2024. So they're saying, what are your findings on this? Because it's getting in the way of the actual trial, which is now 61 days away. That's so short. I saw Sleuthy Goosey last night just eviscerate another YouTuber. <laughs> and the biggest takeaway, I, if you guys don't know how, who she is, she's brilliant. Uh, and basically what she was saying is like, all of this has no bearing. Facts are facts. There's either facts that clearly show Richard Allen did this or there aren't. You can't change. All of this weird stuff ultimately doesn't matter. So I agree with Daddy Hennessy. Yeah. <laughs> Grandpa <laughs> Hennessy or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Grandpa <laughs> Hennessy's in the house and he That's is right. putting his OG. foot down. So, yeah, the yeah, OG Hennessy is in. <laughs> He's saying, listen, first clarify why you want this, uh, this contemptuous conduct hearing. And then the next one says, verified petition for recusal from contempt proceeding. So now they actually just want to toss this whole thing out from what I'm understanding. Am I understanding it right? I'm not a lawyer. You're not a lawyer either, right? <laughs> But when I read this, I'm like, they're basically saying, we have other priorities. Sorry, let me go to the, which means getting this case to trial. They yes. pray the court to recuse herself is what they're saying. The defense is saying this contempt proceeding is getting in the way. It's a distraction. You know, they've now done. And I agree because the Supreme Court of Indiana already addressed this. So I don't know what the prosecutor is trying to do. Now, they did leave the door open for this to kind of happen. They kind of hinted at how to do this. But, you know, what the only thing that could potentially possibly happen is they go, they get booked in a jail, bond out, and get right back to work. Yeah. I mean, but at the same time, you know, there's really, that's the extreme worst, and it's probably not going to be what happens. Um, they can't kick him off the case. Not, you know, I don't think so. That's what everyone seems to be saying. That's what the and, lawyers say. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The uh, law tubers are saying, and defense diaries, that's where I listen to you as well, to hear like all the, the legal expertise. And they're just saying, no, they can't now fire them again or kick them off again. So, Ali Mata I, is the best for sure. Yeah. And I agree. It's a waste of time to have this, this hearing now. Now they've all got to focus and prepare for this trial, which is only a two week trial set for May. Also, Michael Moore said, tainting Norse history, shaking my head. No, no. Remember that when we talk about the Odinist thing in this case specifically, it's White supremacists hijacking yes, Odinism. Absolutely. And to be clear, you know, something I, I need to bring up. My friend, uh, the Captain Howdy, makes amazing videos. Yes. He, you know, it upsets him physically that they've hide racists have hijacked like a pagan religion where people are potentially, it's like satanic panic. So there's people like being put in danger because 
some groups of people just associate anything not their version of Christianity as Satanism or something like that. Yeah. And so paganism is very beautiful and uh and and just about nature, very peaceful, but Odinism is not the the type of Odinism we're talking about is not yeah. peaceful at all. Exactly. It's something that they've hijacked, especially in the prison systems, right? It's like prison gangs and white supremacists that have hijacked this and made it their own, which might as well be like terrorism. Well, and their problem with Christianity, when Patrick Westfall was interviewed not long ago on a YouTube channel, yes. he actually explained it, uh, Christian and why Brad Holder wasn't allowed to be part of their club anymore is because he was going to church and Christianity is a the, all the main figures in Christianity are Jewish people. And so it's incompatible with white supremacy. Interesting. So that, that was that's an why interesting they're, interview. That's why they're so drawn to Norse mythology. And it's because it's supposedly more pure. Interesting. So... This one is now the next document, which says verified petition for recusal of the prosecutor from contempt proceedings. And the defense here is basically saying all the reasons why Nicholas McClellan should not be at that proceeding. So if it does go ahead on March 18th, they're saying he should. He accessed, read, and quoted a, a defense pleading that was filed ex parte. We went over that recently as well. And that he should not be there at this hearing, basically. The council prays the court to bar <laughs> Prosecutor McClellan from participating in any contempt hearings. Denied. She's, yeah, denied. Yeah, mean, that's exactly. Deny it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you. What do you think Judge Gold's going to say? Deny it. <laughs> just like that. Denied. That's her like knee jerk natural reaction. Just... Exactly. Everything just denied. And the speedy trial mm -hmm. she granted because she had no, no other option at this point. It was grant the speedy trial or let him go. So that one wasn't denied because she couldn't. She <laughs> right. <laughs> otherwise she would have. Otherwise she would have. Now this sure. is interesting because I thought initially it's just from the state. No, it's from the defense. Comes now counsel for attorneys Baldwin and Rosie and objects to the change of venue from Carroll County to Allen County. Remember, judge, uh, special judge, Fran Goal is from Allen County. And here again, I'm just highlighting things. Uh, they say the Honorable Francis Escol, but it's actually a CEO. Don't say S now. It's S Seagull, you guys. <laughs> was appointed a special judge in the Carroll County Circuit Court for this cause. Her authority in this case is only pursuant to that appointment. I like that. You see, they're laying down some rules here. They're like, why are you? Why do you keep taking it to your turf? You're gonna go <laughs> to Carroll County. I like that. Carroll's so tiny. Uh, that courthouse is doesn't fit many people. So it's interesting. I don't know. Are you gonna be there? I. Uh, for the 18th, it depends. It's it will be in Allen County, uh, Fort Wayne. Um, actually, was born there and spent mm -hmm. nine years of my life there. But the first nine years, and it's a lovely town. It's also kind of burnout at the same time, but all the good ones are. Um. <laughs> so, I if uh, I might, I want to go to the trial for sure. Yeah, the trial. I mean. I wonder how that'll work, you know. <laughs> are they going to sell tickets? Are they going to be like, no, you need to bid to be... Because how? They're going to accommodate everyone. You, gotta show up case? The, you have to show up early and wrestle the murder sheet for seats. That's what I heard. <laughs> Probably. I think <laughs> they're going to organize the tickets here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carrie said, I think the judge is complicit in derailing this case. Well, yeah. I don't know if I, I wouldn't be able to disagree with that. I'm just like, what has been going on in this case, right? Yeah. Courtney says, better start booking hotel. It's going to be busy. Well, you're local. <laughs> yeah, Everybody my sister lives there anyway, so I'll just crack okay. it. Now, let's get to this oh boy. crazy document. This document is so crazy that it's 18 pages. Now, it's, again, going to be too much to read every single word, especially also for my vocal cords. As you guys know, it's struggling a little bit. <laughs> so I've highlighted it as well so we can discuss things. And I can't wait to hear, <laughs> to pick your brain on some of these things. So here, yeah, this is this is now brand new. It's breaking news. It just came out. And it's such a crazy document. 
if you thought the defense, not the defense, the prosecution was being just a little bit shady, wow, this document's like, what are they hiding? Why are they not giving over all the evidence, especially at this point? They better now, because the trial is set for May. Welcome, uh, Stacey. So they say motion to compel and request for sanctions. Comes now the accused, Richard Allen, by and through counsel, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rosie, and moves this court to compel the state of Indiana to provide certain discovery that the defense believes exists, but that the state of Indiana has not provided to the defense. Now, how can they do that? Just not provide evidence? Uh, sometimes incompetence looks like malice. Uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, True. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if we can be like this. Is this better? Maybe this is better. You guys could see better. Now, it gets very interesting, okay? Like and share. Other people need to learn this information as well. Because for now, it's like, oh, okay, we're warming up. But then the more you read, your eyes just go bigger and bigger. Like, wait, what? So I'm just sticking to the highlighted parts as well. They say the state of Indiana did not respond Okay, to a letter. So I have to go up. There was a certified letter. Okay, yeah. For example, on February 20th, we're on page 2 of 18, 2024, the defense sent a certified letter to the prosecutor's office seeking many pieces of evidence. I mean, look at that date, February 20th of 2024. My <laughs> word, it's like seven years later. Okay, seeking many pieces of evidence, over 20, that the defense believes exists, but appears the state of Indiana has failed to turn over to the defense. You can't withhold evidence. This is a common theme, unfortunately. Oh, man. Here they say the state of Indiana did not respond to the letter, but rather sent one e-discovery strand, which contained a small portion of that evidence requested, including certain videotaped interviews that have never been turned over involving people integral to the timeline. Now, do you remember when, when they said they delete, of course you do, it's big, right? When they deleted the interviews of the supposed Odinus. Isn't that crazy? But also the family members also, you know, the most important time frame of a crime is 48 hours, right? And then every day after that, it's less and less likely to be solved. And so the first week gone is just horrific. And there again, do you think that's incompetence or malice? <laughs> I I want to give the benefit of the doubt, but right. man, I don't know. How do you do how? The, didn't they have little recorders or backup or anything, you know? I just and what I, I I put on my tinfoil hat pretty regularly because you <laughs> stay health balanced you know but that's that's a stretch for me if it was malice i i i would lock them all up lock them up yeah <laughs> right oh man lock them up if it was mistake honestly like geez come on and even to not re-interview them like if if they interviewed all these people that they thought were interesting to talk to in the beginning and they if you guys aren't following, I hope you'll check out the playlist because we've gone over all the documents up to this point. Um, so if they lose those, maybe think of re-interviewing them if they were so important. They did with some ISP stepped in and re-interviewed some of them after. Some, the yeah, some. Yeah. I saw from this, yeah, right. There were some that still they have, but others not so much. Oh my goodness. Uh, sorry if I'm missing some of your comments. Of course, we <laughs> we're very focused. Yeah, I will watch the live chat replay as well as I do and catch up there. And please leave your comments below as well so that I can see what you think about all of this because it's absolutely crazy. So they say the frustration from the defense is that this is not the first time that the defense has had to make specific requests for specific evidence that the state has failed to turn over to the defense. That should wow. never be a thing. No, like they have to basically identify the needle in the haystack and ask for that specific needle. There's wow. probably stuff they don't even know should exist. They don't even know what to ask for that might be important, honestly. Exactly. And then again, a highlight says, for example, one of the more important pieces of evidence in this case is the data retrieved from the phone found at the scene where the victims were found, as this piece of evidence contains data concerning the down the hill video and other important information. That's now, like why the, on earth would that's the biggest thing? That's the, what? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> that is a red flag that they're not even handing that over. Evidence from the phone. 
it just gets the worse first and worse. Thing, day one, welcome, defense team. Here we go. Here's the most obvious evidence. Right. Wow. That really, that one is very concerning. Also, I've heard you say before, does the, the whole narrative of the, the, the timeline doesn't quite make sense, right? Guys downhill, and then it's like, okay, they go across the creek, and then they get murdered, and the person scurries off. Does that make sense to you at all? Because to me, that never really made sense either. In broad daylight, guys down the hill, no one sees them running across the creek, and then just suddenly the worst happens and someone runs across. What? The t no, it makes no sense to me at all. The timeline presented by the prosecution parking a mile away, and this is from my buddy Yellow Jacket. One night she was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever, and not to, that sounds out of context a little bit or whatever, but she was absolutely right. Think about somebody parked a mile away, walked through the trails, looking at people face on, even with the covering or whatever, multiple people goes, you know, across the bridge, murders them, or, you know, takes them down across, murders them not that far away, and then walks back to be seen by cameras and other people or, or whatever. And this is according to the prosecution. It doesn't mean it's true. And then we later find out that some of that might not be true at all. Um, and uh, the witnesses, it's going to be super interesting when the witnesses get on the stand. That's going to really yes. make or break all of this. Absolutely, because if we see what the defense says, the witnesses say, it's not at all what the prosecution is saying they said, let alone the witnesses who provided details for the sketches, of which the defense is saying there's another sketch that none of us ever saw. They didn't even see it. <laughs> there's a third sketch, but the poofy hair. Oh, my goodness. So there's the old guy sketch and then the poofy hair sketch. Those None of those are Richard Allen. Oh, I agree that and people are stretching saying they are they both are because of something uh, a politician Doug Carter said uh, I mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> someone did point out he's a politician he does speak like one it's like okay guys here we go here's a sketch but just remember <laughs> just think of the person from the neck down yeah. don't think of their face <laughs> at all here's a sketch only of someone's head but just think of them only from the neck down. I'm like, okay, it's a very strange case. <laughs> very interesting. So people are freaking out here in chat saying, wait, did they literally say the defense does not have this important evidence from the phone, as in from Libby's phone? Yes, that's what they're saying. This phone and the data contained has been available since 2017, yet the defense did not receive the data from that phone by the deadline of December 14th of 2022 as designated by local rule. The defense, knowing this evidence simply had to exist, everybody knows that, finally sent an email to the prosecutor on June 17th of 2023 requesting the data from several phones, including the phone in question that belonged to Liberty German. Don't you also find it strange that even with that narrative from the state of how the crime went, that the person would put the phone in a shoe under one of the victim's bodies? Weird, right? I... So many strange things. <laughs> Are you speechless? <laughs> you know, what, 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 what kind of... That, isn't that so strange that they say, because that's what was in the Frank's memorandum, right? That the phone was in a shoe. Or just it was just under, under the, the shoe. body, right? Yeah. So that's just... And then underneath of her. Like, they purposely left it. I know. That's just weird as well. But now there's a, a victim's phone that isn't... Libby's phone? I know. <laughs> From this document. Don't worry, we're getting to I'll it. Get there. Sorry, I'm jumping. Let me just address this quickly. So Dennis says this channel supports Richard Allen. Now, this channel supports a fair trial <laughs> for Richard Allen because it's looking incredibly shady over here. It's not the usual. Mm -mm. This is not the usual of what we see with true crime cases. Something is sus. It's been for many years before this arrest was even made. Right. So... The defense, knowing that this evidence simply had to exist, as we all would assume it would, it's very important evidence. They send that email, right? So they say the state of Indiana did not provide the phone data from Liberty German's phone until September 8th of 2023, nearly nine months after the state of Indiana should have turned over that evidence and nearly three months after the defense specifically requested that evidence. 
even though the defense is not required to make a specific request for relevant evidence. Yeah, so a lot of this is pointing out that there was a deadline to turn over evidence and much of the most important evidence wasn't turned over until way later and they had to specifically request it. Just <laughs> it's so bizarre be. that they have to specifically request things. And if they don't, then it's like, oh, well, they didn't ask for it. <laughs> I don't think that's how it should work. So um, if there's something that I skip over that I didn't highlight, just let me know if you want to, because you also read the document before. So if you want to talk about it. Appreciate that. See. How are you doing? How are you? <laughs> doing good. So this, I'm going to this part here that it took McClellan. 131 days to turn over this is exculpatory evidence and it was only turned over after McClellan knew that the defense would ultimately find out about the exculpatory evidence. So let's just go up here to see what it is. Okay, so they talk about this includes data, reports and other information related to the images of the bridge purportedly taken on Liberty German's phone at 205 on February 13th of 2017 as well as an image of Abigail Williams walking on the bridge purportedly taken on Libby German's phone at 2.07 p.m. on February 13th, 2017. Both purportedly sent through Snapchat. Okay, so we didn't miss anything there. What we want to get to is that geofencing, right? Oh, my word. My eyes went so big when I read all of that. Yeah, so things that have been presented since day one that we've all seen weren't the originals or or, or any kind of communication about them hasn't been given to the defense, which they should have received immediately. Those are like the yes. standard things. Of course. I mean, obviously the public cannot have those things. The public would love to see those types of things. But no, the defense on day one should have had it. And they've withheld it according to what we're reading here. So, yes. <laughs> Angela LD says, after G told us the other day, I binged r &M Productions for hours. <laughs> great quality with great questions and light recommend okay thank you so much so here they go on i'm just gonna read a little bit here the week of august 5th of 2023 the defense took several depositions at the conclusion of that week it became clear to the prosecution that the defense was pursuing information concerning certain odinous that had been investigated by three law enforcement officers todd click greg ferency and kevin murphy now one of them was shot right if i remember correctly uh yeah in a shootout outside of uh he was like walking out there was a shootout or something they threw the guy threw a um a molotov cocktail into the police station i think it was yes yes that was great fairancy i think strange mysterious deaths as well yeah when they're busy investigating this odinist angle of course well okay we could dive into that that is a a scary rabbit hole for sure. Definitely all the strange deaths, never mind all the arson events. Those are all right. Interesting. Interesting discussion. The polygrapher dying of a murder and arson. Oh, I forgot about that one. That's true as well. We have talked about it before. So if you missed it, it's somewhere there on the playlist. But yes, there's a lot of strange deaths as well. Which we're not trying to go to conspiracy land. It's just we're not even trying to. It's just like falling in our lap. It's just it is like what it is. Yeah. Happened. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Upon receiving this missing evidence, the defense was surprised or shocked to learn that on May 1st of 2023, the prosecutor's office signed for the Todd Click letter and the exculpatory evidence and information contained in that letter, yet failed to alert the defense as to the existence of this exculpatory evidence until after the prosecutor knew for certain that the defense would definitely be calling Todd Click in for future depositions, at which point in time the defense would most assuredly learn of the existence of this exculpatory evidence. So it's like they sniff out to see what the defense will be, what the angle will be, and then only hand over evidence a little bit that they think. Well, they, they look in people's drop boxes and all kinds <laughs> okay, of things. That too. Uh, you know, I think it's important to reiterate that the defense didn't come up with these theories they're only repeating what trained professionals came up with exactly and they're the only ones who've had basically fresh eyes on the case with all the discovery that they are getting which it seems like they still need to get more so it's very interesting to hear That's a good point yeah 
Well, and then, you know, I was like, oh, God, they've implanted Judge Gull implanted two of her friends as defense attorneys. And then they got, you know, um, they got taken on back off the case. And then they're, you know, Labrado was like, uh, I think this is, you know, he thought it was Odin related. And then it, I was just, I was just uh, blown away that, you know, <laughs> he would go against like everything I thought would happen and and come out and say that. Yes, except at the end he said that Judge Cole would be the right judge for this case. Come on, man. <laughs> well, he has to he has to look at yeah. it every day. So yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But it was interesting that he said that, and it's gonna be interesting in this document as well, which we're on only on page five. It gets more and more interesting. As I say, we're going deeper into this, and it's unbelievable what they're saying in this document here, especially about that professor that initially law enforcement said, nah, he said it's not, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said it looked like people were trying to basically imitate Germanic ruins, mm. which makes sense if it is Odinus or white supremacist hijacking Odinism. Yeah, it sounds like they would do something like that. <laughs> or someone trying to pen it on the Odinists or yeah, something. Or yeah, that, or that, or that true as well. Or even, you know, some people in their own rituals make up their own symbolism that satisfies, you know, and that's what makes a signature is something that isn't integral to the actual murder, but that satisfies an emotional part of the killer. So, I don't know. Question, is it scary living there or not? <laughs> is <Absolutely>. it scary? <laughs> yeah, I would... And it's nervous. actually, I'm more scared of the police. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after the Jesse Snyder story, which is on r and Productions, um, A Reckoning in Carroll County is the video, which I told you guys about in the last Delphi live stream. But that whole story, I believe you knew. You or your wife knew Jesse Snyder, right? My wife uh, was good friends with him. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's scary because... If you didn't, if you don't know the story for everyone that's here now, it, it's the police basically ruined an innocent man's life, and he died in a very strange way as well, just like found dead on the side of the road. Yeah, and it was unreal. initially reported as like a shooting or something, and uh, and then later changed to the correct what happened was suicide. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, they, even after they found him not guilty and they threw out the case and made the cops hand back all his guns, uh, um, Doolin emailed or sent a letter to his boss telling him that he got away with all this crap and blah, 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 and they fired him. Yeah. Dan Doolin, we've heard that name before. That's the same guy who's that, what do you call conservation officer that said, oh, yeah. Richard Allen did say he was there. <laughs> you know, five years later, he's like, oh, yeah, I spoke to him. He was there. He doesn't have a great history. Mm, doesn't seem so. Can you, you imagine know. seven, six years go by and they're like, you know, they do press conferences where they're like, who was parked at the CPS building and who was wearing this and pictures? And he never, ever remembered Oh, didn't I interview that guy that said all of that or whatever? You know, like, what, what's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, five years later. It was a guy. <laughs> but even though, you know, like Richard Allen said, we later found out that Richard Allen said he left around 1.30, or, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. And Betsy Blair actually saw a kid in his 20s with curly hair. And then when she was leaving, she saw uh, what reminded her of a 1965 Comet, a very, yes. very different vehicle than what Richard Allen owned. And so yeah. that's going to play out really interestingly in the trial. Yes. Do you think that this trial will be televised? No. <laughs> I don't think so. It, it should be. <laughs> It should be because it's already there's so much mystery and secrecy. It really should be. But I don't think it's going to be. If there's ever a time for transparency, it's now. Yes. I'm sure media will fight for that. But 
Oh man, I hope so. I hope we'll be able to watch it. Yeah, I mean, uh, Baldwin and Rosie are professionals with a ton of experience. They are basically the best of the best, honestly. And it's just a different game. McClelland should have never, he should have requested a special prosecutor regardless yes. of anything. Yes. And now that he's got co-counsel, also run things by him. <laughs> Maybe run things by him instead right. of digging into documents you shouldn't be reading. <laughs> yes. Mm. Now it gets interesting. Okay, they say it is highly likely that the prosecutor would have never turned over that exculpatory evidence to the defense if they basically didn't ask for specific evidence. Now they say the very last discovered item that the defense received before the prosecutor requested that the defense be kicked off the case was geofencing evidence that the defense believes was received on October 6th of 2023. The geofencing evidence was received nearly 10 months after the state was required to turn it over. What's the delay? What's the holdup? You know? And they say, and contain what appeared to be highly exculpatory evidence concerning a variety of important matters, including the phone numbers of multiple people who appear to have either been at the crime scene or within 60 yards to 100 yards of the crime scene during the very times when the victims were reportedly being murdered, according to the state's timeline provided in the probable cause affidavit. Isn't that shocking? Oh, you got some map time for us. So if you... <laughs> If yeah, if if you don't mind, I want to no, do it. Do it. I want people to do this. So yes. quick, let's ask our chat too. How big do you think a hundred yards from the crime scene in any direction? So that'd be a diameter of two hundred yards, a radius of one hundred yards. Do you think the trails are within that area? Do you think the cemetery is within that area? Do you think houses would be in that area? Let me show you. Yes. So well, we 91 know. 91 meters. <laughs> Just stuffing it for them. 91 meters for those <laughs> who want to know. <laughs> yeah. The entire world is on the metric system except us. <laughs> we, we use toes and feet and toenails to measure things. Who knows? Uh, so we know that the crime scene is directly in line with the east side of the cemetery. You know, give or take 50 feet from the water. So we'll just choose a spot right here. Um, when I click on this, you can see the radius changing. And the radius is half of a circle. So technically, the diameter of the circle is 200 yards. Okay. That's how big a hundred yards is. There are multiple people at the time of the murders, in the time frame of the murders, a hundred people. Let me click and let me zoom a little more. Yeah, they say can see your pointer. At the moment. Yeah. yeah, I don't I um <laughs> can you see the yellow though? Yes. Okay. That yellow represents a hundred meters in any direction from the crime scene. That does not contain the cemetery. That does not contain the trails. So DP, uh, Cheyenne, the people that were with those people, uh, Brad Weber at his house to the south there, anybody in the cemetery, anybody on the roads, none of those people would be included. There are multiple people that are within that amount of space. Ron Logan's is up there on the right mm -hmm. upper part. Um, you have Yvonne Haynes at directly south. Uh, the, you know, the Webbers there south and to the east a little bit. But it blows my mind. And and so a geofence um, now I, I don't know the full I don't know everything about this, but what I do know is that cell phones have a range of 22 to 44 miles. Okay. And cell phones are constantly at all times. They are reaching out to every tower within 44 miles at the most 22 at the least and saying, Hey, are you the fastest? 
and are you overloaded? And it, it's constantly negotiating where to send its data through which tower. So back in 2017, there's a website, and I don't have it pulled up right now, but I'll just explain. There's a website where you can go and you can look where towers were. Back in 2017, you can see all of them. And within um, a 20-mile radius, when you go 20 miles away from the Monon High Bridge, that's even less than the bare minimum of the 22 miles that a cell phone can reach. Uh, that includes Logan Sport and Lafayette. So there's a tremendous amount of towers out there. So there weren't just two towers that a cell phone can ping off of, like a lot of people say. So we're talking, we're talking like 15, 20 towers that a cell phone in those woods could easily reach and communicate with. So they can triangulate based on cell tower power, the signal power and and where it's hitting the different towers. And then it can, there's a formula that determines all that and they can get very, very accurate results. And a hundred yards is a football field. And that's the max that they're saying, the radius they were seeing people in, which is just the biggest bombshell of all of this documentation today. Right. So we're going to show them your map again. I just want to make sure that everybody understands what they're saying in this document is that there were multiple people, multiple cell phones pinging in that little circle at the time, in that time frame when the murders occurred. I mean, we haven't heard that before. <laughs> right. And they don't say it's Richard Allen's phone either. We haven't heard anything about his phone. And they, well, they clearly say his phone is not. Yeah. <laughs> there. Mm hmm. Sure. This is so shocking. So, to continue, because they keep going with it, they say in this late discovery, the defense found a map prepared by someone, presumably law enforcement, that appears to track the movements of these people in and around the crime scene on the afternoon. Now, this is a typo for them on February 13th of 2017, including between 3.02 p.m. and 3.27 p.m. at or very near the location within 60 to 100 yards of where the bodies were ultimately found the following day. Wow. <laughs> Multiple people. So we're going to, it keeps going, we'll go over it again. <clears throat> but that's quite odd because we always wondered, wouldn't they, wouldn't they know, wouldn't they be able to do that geofencing? This was always a question, but apparently they did. It's I've been that, yelling forever, where is the cell phone data? Yeah. Now there's some of it, but they don't have all of it because they say the state hasn't given them all of that. They just don't have that report. <laughs> and that's the point of this ultimately is that they don't. And did the state even investigate those people? Did they interview those people that they were able to tie the phone numbers out there to? We have exactly. no idea. And neither does the defense. That is very shocking. <laughs> Let's put it like this again. So they said since they returned to Richard Allen's defense, Allen's attorneys have specifically requested via email February 26, 2024, that the state of Indiana provide all narrative reports related to the geofencing data, as well as all documents related to the geofencing data. But the state of Indiana so far has claimed that no such documents exist. Oh, my word. It's too many coincidences now. You know, like the videos just not existing of those interviews of those people, the supposed Odinists, right, the group of which one of them confessed to being there when the girls were murdered and said, if you find my spit on them, and I can explain that away, am I still going to be in trouble? And his sister passed that polygraph test and everything. Two sisters. Two sisters. Oh, my gosh. This case will just drive us. It will make us not sleep. That's why I'm up at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> this is why Delphi does this. Oh, my goodness. So... They, even Mr. Grizzly is very much part of these conversations in the house now about Delphi. He's like, so what's happening there with Delphi? Okay, let me tell you. <laughs> you asked, let me tell you. <laughs> Hours later. My goodness. So they say, again, the defense is at the mercy of the prosecutor's claims of the existence or non-existence of such evidence. That's scary. As it relates to the geofencing evidence, it would be shocking that law enforcement would take the time to put a map together tracking the movements of certain phones in and around the crime scene between 12.39, that's very specific, 12.39.54 p.m. and 5.49.06 p.m. on February 13th of 2017, but then not follow up with detailed narrative reports concerning the geofencing analysis of that data. 
<laughs> so shy. It's, like, it's heartbreaking. Drop. Yeah. It is. I mean, that's again where, where you said, is it incompetence or malice? I don't know. There are tiers of evidence, right? And <laughs> that data is top tier. Yes, it's absolutely. It's nearly impossible to explain away your cell phone in a remote location like that. So. Oh, my goodness. And at some, at some point there, Ron Logan wasn't there, but he was later. So his you know? cell phone, uh, he had a phone call at like 2.09, and he was on in, lo in the area of the trails. Phone calls don't use GPS, so it's not as accurate. But he received a text at uh, around 8 and, and again at 10 p.m. And his, which are, since 2013, a law went into effect where they all text messages must contain extremely accurate uh, location data. So GPS and tower data, uh, because in the event of emergency or something, they need to be able to find a person, right? So he was in the location of the bodies uh, yeah. at 8 and 10, which is maybe he, because it, it was dark out, granted, by that time. Maybe he got close and never actually saw them, but it's super weird and it should have been vetted much harder than waiting 30 days to search his house. But hindsight's 2020, right? Right. Do you personally think that Ron Logan, that's a heavy question. <laughs> Careful now. <laughs> Do you personally think that Ron Logan is bridge guy and or is involved in the murders? I don't know. But Lois Gibson is an expert like holds the world record um i trust her analysis and i there are some weird things um do i know for certain of course not uh, do i think it's possible yes um i can't hard say like could it be richard allen i lean towards no but I don't know, you know, like we, I just, we just don't know. And it's my opinion. My opinion is that I don't think he is. I don't think there's strong enough evidence. And, um, and that's what a trial's for. Right. Exactly. So. Is it not also strange that the state prosecutor did not want the probable cause affidavit released because he said, no, there's going to be more arrests. <laughs> but now it's as if we're supposed to just forget about that. And this is the lone wolf. Richard Allen is the guy. That's it. Don't don't just forget about all that. That's such a great question because I've been trying to figure out why would they think more people were involved? Well, maybe that's the answer. The phone, the, the phones in the area. But maybe they, you know, <laughs> did they even try to chase that stuff down? And then why be so bold as to say that in court? It's ridiculous. I, I don't. Yes. I just <laughs> shake my head at stuff. <laughs> Sometimes. That's a lot of this case. It's just like, oh, my. Could you please, could you mention Lois Gibson? Explain to the Grizzlies who Lois Gibson is and what you mean. Lois Gibson was a forensic artist. Um. And she holds the world records or record for cases solved from uh, doing uh, sketches. Like maybe I'm a little bit wrong there, um, but she, what she did is she did a comparison. So the the height between our feet, our kneecaps, our hips, our arms, and our head. Regardless if an image is squeezed or extracted, there it's 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 pretty exacting. And then she did an overlay, right? And she's like, in my opinion, because even in court, when even when the bullet comes down, those experts still have to say, in my opinion, because it is, but it's an expert opinion. Um she felt that Ron Logan matched Bridge Guy. Now, the first image that was released of Bridge Guy was like squished. He was like squishy and squashier. Yeah. And then 
the second when they released the video, it was like drawn out. Now using the the bridge and things like I used, um, um, you know, like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Well, you can the the bridge trestles are ten feet across, right? And so, and by using algebra, my first determination of bridge guy was five foot three inches, and everybody's like, "No, you're wrong. You're an idiot." And then um, the captain and I actually went out to the bridge and we, uh, with the help of his wife and my son, we, we set up a, uh, uh Oh, I'm freezing. Yeah. You hear me? For a second. We yeah. Yes. <laughs> we set up a height chart at the exact location of where bridge guy stood and matched the um, angle with it, there's an app. Uh, so, you know, when people want to recreate family photos from like when they were children, Captain used one of those apps and we lined it up and we figured about six foot. Uh, and so there's also some other people on YouTube that have taken some good attempts at it and the range has been different. And so it, it's it's not as easy. And the original range of the height of bridge guy given, uh, plus he was a redhead with not blue eyes, Richard Allen and <laughs> brown hair with, with very striking blue eyes. And it's, yeah. I, I remember don't... that not blue eyes and then they arrest him. And it's like, Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and a lot of the witnesses, he was either wearing black or he was wearing blue or it's like, I feel like sometimes, they're probably seeing different people. Yeah. And it sounds like there could be multiple people, which is what the document is saying, which is probably yeah. what maybe a lot of our gut feel is, is that, you know, even with the argument, is it Richard Adam or not? Well, he's innocent or proven guilty. But I think many people believe, well, he could be involved, but surely there's more. I think that's often an answer I see. They think he might be involved, even if they say Ron Logan, even if they say Kevin Klein, but it might be a group or more involved than this type of evidence coming out now makes it quite plausible that it could have been a group of people. I feel like that information we just learned today about the cell phones is going to be such an important part of this case. Yes. Whether, whether whatever happens in this trial, regardless, that data should have been number one priority to track down. Absolutely. I'm just aghast at it. Yes. <laughs> and we didn't even know this was going to happen <laughs> right, when we were right. going to talk today. This is we just like, just oh, wow. chat about normal stuff. <laughs> it was <laughs> going to be a, a relatively casual chat and became very <laughs> intense very quickly. <laughs> wow. So here they say again, again, specifically, someone prepared a map which tracked the February 13th, 2017 afternoon movements of multiple phones in and around the place where the victims were ultimately found the following day. Particularly, some of these movements appear to have occurred between 3.02 p.m. and 3.27 p.m., either at the scene where the victims were ultimately found on February 14th of 2017 or within 60 to 100 yards from that site, and none of the phones or people associated with the phones have any affiliation with Richard Allen. There it is. That is shocking that, as well. That's kind of damning too yeah and they never found anything on his phones from what they've said right even at from the search warrants now did he tying him to the victims right nothing links him to the to the crime yeah. digitally now did he shut his phone off during that time frame that would sway my opinion in one way or another mm -hmm. if they can show that his phone was moving back towards his house or whatever during this time frame then obviously that's that sways one way but if it shows that he shut it off and then it turned back on later before and after the murders that would to me be pretty powerful evidence yes mary says ra had a burner phone question mark maybe well it seems like he didn't get rid of anything he had from that day <laughs> Right, he held on to the jacket, the gun, gun to jacket. Else use it, everything. Yeah. Almost like he was innocent. Yeah. He 
and he uh, offered up the information initially. And then yeah. when he was interviewed again, he was very helpful. I know sometimes perpetrators can be. I'm aware people right. are going to say they can. Sometimes they do. Yes, sometimes they do. It's just like he really seemed to walk into this one. Yeah. Yeah. I. He. It's To me, it seemed like he wanted to be helpful. That's a good point. Elbow's mom reminds us he was he was looking at his stock ticker and also the fish. <laughs> so he said he was looking at the stock ticker, which makes that statement quite interesting then to say that none of the phones or people associated with the phones have any affiliation with Richard Allen. They should be able to to prove he was looking at stocks mm -hmm. from his phone while walking out there. They should pretty much be able to track his every movement. Yes. Now, Melissa says, what about the unspent round, the bullet casing? <sighs> Who knows? <man. laughs> I, if it was fired, I might feel different. If it was found the actual time, yeah, they've, they investigated the scene, but it was found many days after it's been, they, they went back to get that bullet. Um, not everyone believes that's the truth and that's fine. None of us have to believe anything. It, you know, it doesn't matter. We're not, you know, I don't have money placed as a bet to whether he's guilty or not guilty. Nobody should that that'd be, that's weird. And <laughs> it's weird. Yes. It doesn't matter. You know, if you're wrong or right, it's okay. You know, I, I don't, it gets us into the, the weird side of YouTube and it's like, it, it, we're just talking about it. We're we're reporting what we know and helping people who can't get, you know, uh, access to the documents. Or I even get um, some some seeing impaired people who are like, "Thank you so much for reading that." Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to know about it. You know. So. Exactly. So we're just having conversations about it. We don't know. I mean, how would any of us know? No one knows anything, especially in any case before a trial. <laughs> Right. It's always innocent until proven guilty. And so much always comes out at trials. So much more information, you know. So I don't know, though. This one's only a two-week trial. <laughs> Let's hope it's compelling. Best of luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck there. Two weeks. Wow. So I was looking at your channel a little bit. Your videos go back two years. And it says you have 15,000 video or 1.5K videos. So... 1,500 videos? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't analyzed that it. That is impressive. <laughs> oh, thank you. Are you are a hard worker. That's so cool. Work, working hard over here. The Grizzlies do see me almost every day. <laughs> so seems so. Yeah. Oh, that, you know what? But that's the best. <laughs> I love coming into your chat. I'm a fan first before I'm anything else. You know, uh, uh, I used to watch forensic files on repeat to fall asleep. You know, <laughs> now you watch Grizzly True Crime. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you up. so much. I made thank that lovely so short. You I know? super appreciate. Oh, or you have more? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm, we're only on page seven. We have so much more. Let's go. Let's keep going. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I'm saying, I made more. it. I made a YouTube short, if you guys didn't see it, where James from Hoosier Cold Cases says, you know, that he's a fan. He's a Grizzly, <laughs> which was very I nice. I am. <laughs> Okay, let's see what else I highlighted here for everyone. They said it would be shocking if the owners of these phones were not interviewed when their movements were tracked and then replicated on a map depicting their movements around the crime scene based upon geofencing coordinates. Yet the defense has not located any interviews of the owners of these phones. <laughs> One would think. Uh, investigate that. Stop with all the press conferences and, and all that and just investigate that. Now, here we talk about this Purdue professor. They say, however, since getting back on the case, the defense has learned that Jerry Holman, oh, man, he's quite a red flag, isn't he? Everywhere I see him mentioned, he seems like quite a red flag. Jerry Holman did, in fact, learn the identity of the Purdue professor, Jeffrey Turco, on August 12th of 2023 through the Purdue Police Department, and Turco's identity was confirmed a few days later by other law enforcement. Holman even had possession of Turco's report, which contradicted Holman's August 10th, 2023 sworn testimony during the same time frame. Oh my goodness. You have this Jerry Holman contradicting his own sworn testimony. That's not normal. <laughs> yeah, which some people would call lying. Yeah, <laughs> that might be perceived as lying. 
<laughs> so why it's interesting if you haven't followed you know the deep dive of the case and the frank's memorandum and all that is because there was a professor that the detective said said no he they said that the professor said it wasn't odinism right but now when the defense digs deeper they say despite how holman drafted his report turco the professor's conclusions were not inconclusive whatsoever turco was clear that in his opinion and that of a harvard expert the sticks found at the scene were an attempt to replicate a Germanic rune script. Oh, so that's very different to what law enforcement says the professor said, who they forgot his name and couldn't remember, you know, couldn't identify him. I, more than any other piece of evidence, uh, you know, anything, I would like to see that Odin report, honestly. Me too. I've said that to 85 page Odin <laughs> report, right? We want that. Don't know if we'll ever see that. Right. I wonder if it That's will. Will point. we ever? That would be good. You know, maybe it would be after the trial or something. I could make a more informed decision about my feelings about it if I could actually read it, of course. And so could a lot of people. Nah, they wouldn't read it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most wouldn't. We're going to read it to everyone, though. That's right. We're, about, we're especially talking about, we're not snarking at you guys. We're talking about content creators that do not read the documents and then say that their way is the only way, basically without being informed. It oh, takes dear. all kinds. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it takes all kinds. It's space for all of us here. That's right. You do. <laughs> That's the name. <laughs> right. Nice. So, me. yeah, Renee also says, I really want to see that. Okay, let's just see what else I highlighted here for you. They said vi video of Elvis Fields interview was not turned over until September. <sighs> so they do have that. They have a video of him at least. Right. No, he's okay, one that confessed. I'm going to rant for a minute. Ooh, rant time. The Elvis Field stuff is the weirdest thing, like, in this entire case I've heard so far. Like, yeah. I don't care if it's Odinus or whatever, but he said, you know, the day after the murders, he knew there were sticks in, in her hair. Regardless if he actually put them there, he knew they were there. And mm -hmm. some people want to brush off that as like, oh, you know, there's sticks everywhere. Maybe they just got, no, come on. Oh, they fell off a tree that way. No, 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 no. You know, from the people who've seen the photos and made depictions of it, there's no way that that, that you know, they were purposely put there. And then you have experts uh scholars and 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 law enforcement experts who clearly thought it was more than accidental or whatever so i just yes. i don't understand how people are so willing to just brush that stuff aside yes because it's so weird and it's just it's it's i mean for somebody to confess to say that they were there when the girls were murdered and then to say to law enforcement after the interview, like, oh, if you find my if you find my spit on one of the girls and I can explain it away, am I still in trouble? I mean, what? Why would you even say that? There's no <laughs> there's no reason ever to say something like that. Like but then they just let him walk away. Just whatever. I don't care if you just did a bunch of drugs or something. Nobody would just say that. So exactly. yeah, and they just let him go in the house. He said, "Oh, I better, <laughs> I better. Maybe I should call this in." Come on, don't dude. look at that. Only look at Richard Allen in the blue jacket. Okay, That's right. He was there. Not that Mickey. Thank you so much. You say Occam's razor. Simpler explanations are generally better than more complex ones. Yeah, and to me, I don't think the Richard Allen theory is the theory is the simpler one, right? <laughs> well, it seems more complex than all these other ones, actually. Thank you so much for your sticker. All the way from South Africa, home country. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let's see what else we have here. So they do have a video of Elvis Fields. I'm happy to see that because the others they lost. They've got videos of some of them here from the group, but. I watched know. so many of those inter those interrogation videos online. Uh, yep. Is it JCS or whatever? Uh, but I I, I want to see that one. Oh, yeah. On that. Right. Yeah, definitely want to see some of these. <laughs> definitely. So they say the biggest concern that the defense has concerning the early trial request is the prosecution's continued violation of the discovery rule. 
my goodness. And here there's also, out of many of these videos that they have, because they lost some of the interviews, some of them have the video, but no audio. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so even if it was something that's like, whoa, like, can you believe that no, no one can hear what they actually said? Do you hire a lip reader at that point or something? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, could, could we? <laughs> so interesting as well, the defense, as I say, they're not playing now. They never were playing. But when I say they're not playing, I guess it's a South African thing when we say they're not playing here. <laughs> they're getting really serious here. Of all the documents we looked at before this one, here they say, you know, they want everything now. They want Derek German's, Libby's dad's law enforcement interviews. They want that. They want Kelsey German's phone dumps of all phones attributable to Kelsey German. It's interesting that at least they, they're combing through everything. Those all are Cody, foundational phone dumps. items. Yeah. Yes. Like the crime originates from the happenstance of that morning and them going to, they, they need to be able to look at all of that. So, yeah. Absolutely. So they, you know, they're going for, they're being very thorough. That's how I want to say it. Yeah. Definitely. And all the geofencing. They say the identity of a of geofence victim from a phone that does not belong to Liberty German. What is that? So this bothers me a lot. Um, my first instinct is that, oh, Abby did have a phone and potentially the the killer took it with them or something. Mm -hmm. And. But maybe it was just labeled weird. Or wrong <laughs> right there's a lot of things we have to try to explain away in this case maybe right. it's just as you start stacking up um so here as well they want all reports of all leak investigations not related to the mitch westerman leak investigations including any reports made by nick mccleland of content providers i like that content providers not creators content providers reaching out to him claiming that they were in possession of leaked information and even more concerning which McLean then ordered the content provider to delete those images. Oh man. Let's hope at some point all the truth in this case can come out. I don't know if it ever will, but we can remain optimistic and hopeful that it will and that there will actually be justice for a 13 and 14 year old girl that these two girls murdered just on a walk on a random day or from school. Like, come on, you know? That's they wanted to enjoy what a about. beautiful day in nature. Yeah. Yep. And yep. As a teenager, you should be allowed, you should be able to do that. Yes, absolutely. So let's hope that this is um, a conversation of many that we'll have, <laughs> especially about it, this case. Anytime. Um, thank you so very much for having me on. Yeah, and thank you uh, for being here and spending time with us. Now the coffee's kicked in. and <laughs> uh -oh. in the morning. I'm awake now, especially Delphi. This case really wakes me right up, my goodness. Um, but everyone, please go check out Hoosier Cold Cases, and you've got some great footage as well that you've taken of the scene if they've never seen it. I've shown it here on this channel before, but go and check out. Um, I will share um, the link to your channel. Wait, actually, I should show your channel. Just hold on one second. Let's do it like this. I've got your channel right here. We're going to show it quickly. There we go. Okay, go subscribe over there. Put uh -oh. the bell on. And check out some of Hoosier's videos. Let me go clean Games. up my channel real fast. <laughs> yeah, Put my best foot don't, forward. Yeah, don't do that. Don't so, judge me, Grizzlies. I'm just a yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your insight very much. Um, Thank you. You know, I, I, I love your channel you. and your conversations that you have with other creators as well. Always bringing in, you know, the logic and the calm. We like that. We like that. Grizzly Cat says HCC is a G. Thanks for spending time with us. Justice uh -huh. for Abby and Libby. Yes, thank you so much. So we're going to go now. If you want to stay till after the outro, that we could chat behind the scenes. Thank you, Grizzlies, uh, for being here for the second stream of the day. If you didn't check out the trial coverage from today, go and check it out. And I will see you all again very soon. Okay, bye, everyone. <laughs>